This is Heather Langenkamp from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Listen to The Dave and Creech Show. This is The Dave and Creech Show, the only podcast where podcaster C.J. Creech and actor Dave Sheridan come together to talk all things entertainment with your favorite entertainers. Want to ask our guests a question? Tweet them to at Dave Sheridan or at CJCNOV88, and they may be asked to our guests live on the show. We do have to ask you stay seated during the podcast because this ride may get a little bit hilarious. Now here's your hosts, Dave and Creech. Hey guys, welcome to the final episode of the Dave and Creech Show in 2016. We are here, Dave Sherrod and CJ Creech, and we have got a ton of stuff to talk about today, both past and present. No, we have a great show. We Look, we have a sort of sad show. I don't want people getting upset. We're going to talk very candid about some of the passing celebrities, at least some of them. I think I have a right to be candid if I knew people. Um, but I also knew how, how, who they were and how funny they were. And if I make a joke or two, it's for them. They're sitting with me right now. They are my co-pilots as I do my podcast in my car. And um, we're also going to talk about sort of memorable interviews and memorable things of our podcast. And uh, I'm just sort of recapping 2016. What was your favorite sort of news story that we did cover? Did you have a memorable one of that? Oh man, I don't know. There was there was quite a quite a, quite some doozies this year. I'm trying to recall, I, the, I remember the Museum of Broken Relationships. I think that okay. one was the, it's probably my favorite that we covered. That or the 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 uh, intervention convention. All right, those are good. Those are good. Now, this is not a news story, but I do feel like uh, the David David epicness was, was one of my funny things, the whole, like, buying the wine and the chocolate and checking into that hotel, the, the marijuana crack hotel or whatever, and then, and then the demise of him getting drunk at Walker Stalker and you having to leave and get him out of there and stuff like that, especially when we're like, you got a drinking problem. I don't have a drinking problem. It's like, yeah, like, apparently you do. But to me, the, the one story I can't, ever forget. I can't get it out of my mind. And it's terrible when you hear what it is. Like, oh, that's a terrible image I have in your mind. But mainly because we love cinnamon rolls and we make those Pillsbury cinnamon rolls at least three times a week. When You know, my daughter gets up, she gets up at 5.30 a.m. and she loves popping those in and making them and then you smell them and you get up and I always have a couple. And uh, But it's it's the guy, at, you know, I don't remember, he was at Walmart, I know he was in Vegas, he was drunk, and he was shoplifting, and he shoved one of those in his ass, right, and he, and he was gay, and then he got tackled by the security guard, and in the tackling, it popped the thing open, right, remember, it was like lodged in his butt, and the, that is a true story, do you remember that one? I remember, yeah. You know, and he was already, his nickname in jail was already sitting in front the fact that he was very luscious. How was your holiday? My my holidays were pretty good, actually. Just uh, got to spend some time with my daughter, some quality time, and she got a bunch of gifts and uh, doesn't play with half of them. Yeah, we got, I got, the kids got everything on their Santa list from Santa, so that was a good year for them, I guess, but, but it's like, it's been so busy for me, I haven't had time to put batteries in any of it <laughs> and, uh, or go out and actually some of the boxes are not even open because it's just been cold and haven't been able to go outside. Like he got some, what are those drone things, you know? So got to wait for a, a good day to go out there and read the directions and get it all set up. The technical side of stuff, all the, like there was a keyboard and you got to download software for it. I didn't do that yet. You know, it's just a bunch of stuff. I'll get around to it, but their vac- their Christmas vacation is almost over. So, so you get, yeah, you get some extra time. Yeah, well, no, I won't get any time. But um, 
I'm oh yeah, you got you got Yeah, I know. You, you're building the house. What do you want this show to be about, Creech? We're here. We are with New Year's Eve. You dragged me out of bed. I wanted to watch Pitbull perform. I don't know if they're going to roll Dick Clark's head out. Is Ryan Seacrest even doing it anymore as well? Is he lined up to, like, you know, wear a jacket and be standing somewhere in Central Park again or wherever they do it, Times Square? He he probably is. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if uh, Ryan Seacrest is out there. I mean, that's only one of his billion jobs that he does. Yeah. They have a bunch of them now. I don't know how many they have. I know it's it's probably uh, Dick Clark's rocking New Year. I don't know if they've eventually took Dick Clark's name off of it yet. Um, he might even, but but he, they might not be able to take his name because actually he might own it in some way. So, um, but they could just get rid of the whole rocking New Year's Eve anyway and just call it whatever. But then there's CNN, and I think like. Um, Anderson They're Anderson Cooper. Cooper, yeah, and Kathy Griffin. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy Griffin. Yeah, that's an unlikely pair. But they do one, and then, uh, you know, there's Ryan. I just – and then I don't know if Pitbull is performing on the Ryan thing. I, I did see something vaguely out of the corner of my ear when the TV was on somewhere in the house that, that – Wait, there's, there's, a TV, a, there's a TV at your house now? Yeah, I've always had a TV. It's not my TV, oh. but, um, yeah, I have a TV. I don't watch it, and we don't, you know, it's not our TV, basically. Oh, okay. But there is a TV at my house, and it tends to just have Fox News on. But I don't I don't have cable. I don't pay for cable. But the bottom line is, um, I heard something where it was Pitbull's New Year. So do, I wonder if Pitbull has a New Year show on his network, and he's hosting it. Or is he just performing? Because the one thing I would say is, because every now and then I do tune in I, to the New Year's Eve thing. You know, we might even flash around to a couple as it gets closer, but we don't watch one of them like, like we're watching this. We're sitting in front of the thing with, like, you know, Chex Mix watching the New Year's Eve show. You know, I've never done that. But, um, but I, I, I would have to say that if I've seen Pitbull perform on TV – three times, not in the entirety. I would never watch him do a full song, but if I've seen the guy in a suit with a microphone doing something on stage, it's always been some sort of New Year's Eve show. And I guess he's, you know, you know, he's a, it's a, he's fun, he's energetic, and his, you know, um, in terms of the upbeat songs, it's always like a, I wouldn't say dance music, but it's, you know, it's energetic, good, you know, party upbeat music he 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 doesn't sit around with a acoustic and do a melancholy song that's not what pitbull does so but i'm just wondering does he do anything else or do they just does that guy like hang out in miami beach you know ride a bike read a newspaper and then the guy puts suit on ears and and sings a song is that all this guy does or, you know, does anyone really go see a Pitbull concert somewhere? He does sing. Well, I, I, sing is probably not the right term. Um, but he, he does he does make music. And it, it, it's been on the radio. His, his songs <laughs> yeah. are usually about partying. And um, he speaks, like, in Spanish, half of them. You know, he's yeah. this culture. Oh, so, see, so maybe he's also on, like, Spanish radio channels on these sort of, like, hybrid Spanish-English channels and stuff like that. He, He's a good he actually uh, has his own channel on a Sirius XM radio. That he's like a DJ on or something? Yeah, it's like the, the Pitbull channel. Well, there you go. His songs are a bit, I think they're, for the most part, sort of just generic songs, even though they're... Pitbull Without a doubt, songs. yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying they're forgettable, but they're just these sort of serviceable party songs, you know, and it's like, okay, that, that's that song, you know. Um, like when Beyonce puts out a bunch of songs, they are, some of them are remotely different than the others, but at the same time, they're more like um, when her new album drops and she's got some new songs and it goes into heavy rotation, you know about it, you know what I mean? They are, they promote it in newspapers, they promote it in, you know, long lead uh, magazines, she's on magazine covers, you know, you know Beyonce has a new album, and you know what 
one or two of the songs are because they always make it a little bit, or they manufacture that they're, contra- they're you know they're controversial in some way. Um, but he he's not controversial. He doesn't do a controversial song. He doesn't get a lot of press on his when his new album out. It, they just kind of get into rotation on the radio, and it's like yeah, that's a new Pitbull song, you know. Um, last week, on, uh, our last episode, we were talking about um, our friend um, Corey Feldman and his performances on the Today Show and his album. His album that he worked on it was like a ten. He did it for ten years, and it's like a double album, and it's about you know going through this journey through hell and escaping hell. And he wrote you know songs that dealt with um, the other Corey and his remembrance of him, and he had all these other artists on and. This it's like what do they call that that type of album? Um, a concept, I guess you call it a conceptual album or something. But you know, it's almost like a rock opera. It's like the Wall. Yeah. You know, it's like a double album, and it tells they're lined up to sort of sort of uh, tell a sort of story like a, an opera, and uh, which is great. And that's and that's the thing is that's where Corey says that he's a very he is a smart guy and he's creative and he just doesn't want to put out 10 songs that are all like upbeat party songs. But on the other hand, when I watched his performance and I see what this guy Pitbull does, it's almost like Corey was, to me, he's, he's letting his own creativity overshadow the fact that he could just go for a low hanging fruit thing. And Corey could have just got those chicks because they were cute girls and just wrote a couple really catchy sort of party club songs that didn't have a lot of lyrics going on and just had a good hook to it. And um, because of his energy on stage, man, he could have been one of these pit bull type guys that could just be wheeled out for a New Year's Eve performance, you know? I agree. It's actually, it's actually funny that you, you, uh, you, you mentioned Corey because uh, on this, this podcast, this, uh, for the last one of 2016, we had a couple of, of polls. I mentioned it a little bit briefly last episode, but this episode we've got the results for the fan votes on their favorite guests and uh, favorite moment. And Corey won for the favorite moment for debuting his song. We'll revisit that segment. Corey Feldman. Hey, Hello, Corey. Mr. Feldman. Hello. You're on with Dave and Creech. How are you? Hey, how you guys doing? Pretty good. Well, how are man. you? Good, good, good. First of all, I came over to your house like, you know, what, four or five months ago, and you played me a whole bunch of music that you were recording for different various things because you don't just do one musical project. You have several music projects going on. This particular single, now, is this with Corey and Corey's Angels, or what is this particular single? Yeah, well, basically, let me give you the nutshell. So, yep. for the last decade of my life, I have been working on this album. And uh, this album, and it's very interesting, it's not like the only thing I put out. Like you said, I work on multiple projects. So, what happened was I started this solo album, you know, 10 years ago with no concept. There was no angels. I was married at the time, actually, with my kid. And, you know, I wrote a song for my kid called Baby Blue Eyes. And, I wrote a song for my ex-wife called For My Love. It was kind of like a little family album that I started. And then what happened was, you know, while I was working on the album, I ended up, you know, executive producing the Two Corys TV show. And that kind of distracted me. And then I went and did Lost Boys, The Tribe. And then uh, after I finished those two projects, we started work on the second season of The Two Corys. And it was during the second season of The Two Corys that I we had this, like, therapist lady. And she gave me this writing assignment to go write a song for my dad. And so I was like, okay. I mean, not, like, for my dad, but, like, to my dad, like a message, like a kind of like a FU type song, you know, getting out my anger or whatever, dealing with it. So I went and I did that as a writing assignment. And then after I wrote it, I thought, wow, man, this song is so good, but it's really truth movement because that's my other band, which is more like a Pink Floyd thing. So I'm like, you know, this is more like truth movement. I think those guys would dig this. So I'm going to give this to them. And then once I did that, I was like, man, I'm in that mode now. I feel like I need to, like, write a whole album because it's just there. You know, when something comes out of you so fast and it's, like, really good and you're like, oh, wow, 
how did I do that so fast? I need to do like, you know, 10 more just like it. <laughs> so that's kind of what I did. And I wrote the entire next album in three months. And I got these guys from Pink Floyd to come join me. And like, I got Pink Floyd's artist. And we did like this whole great album in like three months. Literally, it was the fastest I'd ever done anything. And then we toured for like two years because we did two different tours on it. Uh, one which was like a summer tour. And then we did this other thing called the Lost Boys Ball. So we were literally touring on that thing for, you know, I don't know, a year and a half. And then uh, after that was done, I went and did Lost Boys 3, <clears throat> or, you know, the, uh, what was it called, The Thirst. And then, you know, a couple more movies or whatever. And then I was like, oh, wow, I forgot. I started that solo album like five years ago. I better finish it. So I went back in to try and start finishing it, and that's when I created the Corey's Angels thing. And then it was like, okay, well, let's just make this all one big promotional campaign for this new record. I'm just going to start it subliminally and very, very early so that everybody's not going to have any idea that when I'm throwing these parties, I'm really promoting a new album. <laughs> Ooh. I think that, you know, this, this album is strong, and this new single is definitely got what it takes to make it to the top 40 on Billboard. So that's when I started my campaign, my Indiegogo campaign, where I basically reached out to the fans and said, hey, if you guys really are so excited about this project, prove it by showing me some support and making donations. And I created all these perks that are, like, really cool and keep people interested and stuff. And as a result, we've raised $21,000 to go beat up the record companies, you know? I mean, I guess that's it, to go beat up the radio stations and, you know, try and shove the song down everybody's throat. Right. Because that's what, that's right. what we do. Exactly. So now, um, this what's the name of the single that we're, we're, we're dropping today? What's the, the one we're It's called today? Go For It. And uh, it's a very positive song, a beat song. It's a dance song, for sure. Uh, you know, as I said, it's a double album. So uh, there's one album, one disc, which is called Angelic Funkadelic, and that's to dance. And then there's the Angelic Rockadelic, which is to rock. So there's literally two CDs for whatever mood you're in, I guess. One is to dance. And it's got skits and stuff. It's kind of funny. You know, the whole thing is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. We don't take it too seriously. But at the same time, it's, it's good stuff. It's fun. So anyway, this right. song, uh, this song, go for it is, uh, you know, it's me and Snoop, and it's kind of like, I guess kind of dubstep meets hip-hop meets pop, you know, regular pop music. I guess that's the best way to put it. But it's very upbeat, high energy, and I don't think you can put this song on loud and not dance. It's one of those songs that even, like, white guys have to, like, bob around like a chicken. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you just got to do it. Well, that's perfect, yeah. So... All right, we're, let, let, let's go and play the song right now. Right, Creech? Yeah. Cool. Gonna, let's hear it. Go for it, everybody. Go for it. Get it, get it. All she better yeah. do is go. Hit the club. Tell him. Shoe, let you abolish you. 
Let me tell you from the jump, give it up. We gon' blaze it, we gon' blaze it, we gon' go. think there, Creech? What'd you think? It was actually pretty amazing. I, I, I loved it. Like you said, I mean, you can't help but bop your head to it because, uh, you know, the beat and uh, actually have, I have a really good voice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Also, the Horde got voted as favorite guests. So we'll be we we'll revisit some of that our interviews with the uh, the cast as well. Is the horde the horde is is it out right now? Right? Yeah, we we launched May sixth on VOD everywhere. So um, iTunes, Directv, Amazon. I mean, you know, every I mean, every cable company pretty much imaginable has it running right now on, on video on demand. Um, but take me back from the very beginning. You obviously have a martial arts background. What was, where did, how did you get into this and, and um, where did it all stem from? It's funny. I kind of, I kind of fell into this. Um, like you said, I've been doing martial arts since I was 13. I was always the skinny kid. I was bullied, you know, when I was growing up. So I got into martial arts when I was 13, but I graduated high school, like six foot, 145 pounds. I was like a rake and started working out with weights when I was 17. I took a poster of Stallone, put it on my dorm room door and said, I want to look like that and kind of started doing that. But um, when I was in college, I was a biochem major in New York and got my degree in biochem, came out here to LA to go to chiropractic school. I finished that, passed all four parts of my boards and um, had my clinic hours to put in. I was sitting by my pool one day studying, you know, chiro books. And um, this woman sat down next to me. She was a manager. She asked if I was an actor, told her it was always something that was in the back of my head. And she said that she could get pictures taken of me, start sending me out. A couple of weeks later, I booked my first film. I was a lead bad guy in this film called Killers, and uh, haven't looked back. I uh, met my best friend on that uh, set, and my, he introduced me to my acting coach and started training with him and uh, just been working. I was on Days of Our Lives for like almost three years, Friends, Angel Smith, a bunch of films for Sci-Fi Channel, a lot of action stuff, um, and that's pretty much what I've been doing. And uh, I got tired of waiting for projects to come to me so I started writing scripts I had all these ideas and I've written six scripts and the horde was actually the last one I wrote because I wanted to do something um that could be done on a you know a limited budget and also I want you know something that hadn't really been done before and the reason the horde came about was um I, most horror films are the same it's a bunch of kids they go into the woods the killer or the killers hunt them down one at a time You've seen it a million times, but you've seen it a million times because that's what the horror audience wants, expects, and enjoys. I always thought, what would happen if you had the same scenario, a bunch of you know, kids off on a nature photography trip, a bunch of hills have eyes type mutant people, you know, cannibalistic evil individuals hunting them down, but you had one person in the kids' group who was the next Navy SEAL who could fight back and turn the hunters into the hunted. So you have all the boo scares and gore of a horror film coupled with the action of an action movie. So uh, it's kind of a twist on the classic horror film. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's a mashup of you got your horror set up, and then it goes into the action movie. And both of those mm-hmm. take place, like you're saying, with the Rambo, especially First Blood. You, you both have these tropes that can take place in the woods, and so it's sort mm-hmm. of like both worlds kind of collide. So how did you get involved 
with this film? So it's kind of, uh, it just happened by accident. I, I do a little producing as well as acting, and I went into the offices and just the producing, off, like our production offices, and they were casting the film. They had rented a couple of the rooms for the casting. And uh, so I went in, and they were like, hey, well, can we, we have a, a small role? Do you mind auditioning? And I said, yeah, that's fine. So I auditioned for the smaller role. And then about a week later, I got a call saying that the lead, the actual lead they had booked for Selena had fallen out, and they wanted uh, me to read and potentially play Selena instead of the smaller role. But I was actually at a Packers game at Lambeau Field, and uh, so we just did the audition over the Internet. (laughs) And I got a call the next morning, and I booked the role and then started working a couple weeks later. So going back to the Horde... Uh, Back to the horde. Again, it, it, it's out now everywhere on VOD, VOD yes. rental, every format, whether that's uh, it's DirecTV, Time Warner, uh, iTunes, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. And, um, Ta- so Time, Warner actually, Time Warner is one, the only one that um, doesn't have it right now, but you have DirecTV, Cox, HTTUverse, um, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, um, Voodoo has it as well. So, I mean, if you go to thehordemovie.com, there's a whole laundry list of um, carriers who there's probably you know, 50, 60 carriers across the country that are um, carrying it right now. I love the fact that you can get it on the video game consoles because, honestly, oh, yeah. that's probably where the majority of people are just sort of tapping into it. The movie itself is like a video game at, at parts, you know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> uh, the bones breaking and the, and, and the brutalness to it. You, you know, you have a bit of a, a two in the middle that, you know, you have the Hills Have Eyes and the little mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing. There's also that, that movie, The Hostel, where, uh, uh, you know, oh, those yeah. movies back in that period where it had that kind of, uh, what, what, they, what they claim, what they, the, the, the segment was called torture porn, you know, like, where it's just really brutal and bloody. I mean, those two moments where you where they find they capture mm-hmm. the kid and the girl who Tiffany Brower mm-hmm. plays your fiance, soon to be right. wife. Uh, I've worked with her by the way, actually in a movie with Holt. She's great. Uh, yeah, she was great. She she and you know what? Um, she she brought Selena to life um, really really well because I didn't want her to be just this weak damsel in distress because if she was someone that is involved with someone like Crenshaw, he's going to, you know, teach her stuff. And he's going to, you know, kind of teach her that, you know, let me look, she spits in Costas' face when she's getting taken prisoner. And, you know, and, the, and there's that one line that you know, is my favorite line in the movie where she, you know, when Costas is ranting, I'm gonna, you know, my men are going to hunt him down and, you know, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. You know, and she just laughs and he's like, what are you laughing at? And she says, the fact that you think you're hunting him. Yeah, that was right. You know, and she delivered that so well. She was great. You're his girlfriend slash soon to be fiance you're teaching a um a special ed class for <laughs> underachieving kids it's like i don't Who know need it's, it's like it's like the photography they all class seem like, that you take when you don't want to take labs <laughs> exactly like is it a college was it college kids is that what it was yeah college? like extra credit but, yeah but it, but it was like a community college almost, too, with those kids. I was like, what the hell? Like, you know, yeah. like, like these, <laughs> I go, this, these, these kids are all What's dying. funny. Some, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I look pretty young they, myself. And I'm like, geez, I almost look like one of the girls had, like, the boobs and the butt and the lips. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you, they had to give you the Clark Kent glasses for you to, like, you right. know, like to be more professory, you know, in the whole thing. So uh, <laughs> exactly. that was a good choice. Unless that, was that was my idea. Choice. I was like, I'm Let bringing my glasses, the... guys. <laughs> were they real? Those are your real glasses? They were. They were, yes, oh. yeah. That's I do cute. wear glasses. You get... Do you wear contacts, too? I do have contacts, but I normally don't use them unless I go on a vacation. Or sometimes when I'm shooting, I'll, I'll wear them. But, I mean, for that scene... Being a teacher, obviously, we purposely chose the glasses. Right. From saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm happy with it now to start getting it out so that Byrne can read it, Mosley can read it, uh, I've, you know, getting it to producers, the, you mm-hmm. know, the financiers and stuff like that. From, from you sort of opening page one on the laptop to, to getting to that point, how quickly did it come together on that side of things? 
I wrote this one actually really, really quickly because um, um, I was talking to a couple of people who, you know, I had, you know, told the idea to, and they were like, God, that sounds kind of cool. So I'm like, you know what, let me put this one down. I literally wrote that one in about four and a half, five weeks. I mean, I just like, you know, cooked it. And um, after that, it, ha- it didn't really change, honestly, at all until that moment. We got n- about 99% of what I wrote on that page down onto the screen. The only thing that we had to change was the chase scene that's near the end with the pickup truck and the follow truck. Mm-hmm. I, wanted, mm-hmm. I wanted guys, I wanted some of the mutants coming up on, on the side of the pickup truck on like quads or dirt bikes and jumping in. But the road we were shooting on wasn't wide enough to give you um, the pickup truck, a quad, and a camera car on the side of it. So, you know, I just changed that to the guy jumping in from the side of the road because, you know, that's what we had with location-wise. But other than that, you know, we got 99% of what I wrote down. That, you know, is a testament to the, you know, the cast and the crew that we put together. I mean, those guys kicked ass. And, you know, I just also, you know, want to give a shout-out to all the, um, the actors who played the kids because I was very, very adamant about that. I mean, you got had guys like Mosley and Vernon and Nestor Serrano, Matt Willig and Costas in there. You know, I know those guys can bring it. So, but when we were casting the kids, I wanted to make sure that, the kids were good actors because otherwise it would have turned into something campy. And that's what I didn't want to happen. I wanted to have that, you know, that remake of the Texas Chainsaw feel or the, you know, the um, remake of the Hills Have Eyes, that real just, you know, scary visceral feeling that, you know, wasn't campy at all. And these kids brought it. So I'm very thankful to, you know, everybody involved in this project. And then, and so you shot in LA, how many, how, what was it? I'm I'm assuming it was, an 18 day or a 14 day shoot? What was, what was this? It ended up, I believe being a little bit more than that. Um, but we were, yeah, we were pulling, we were pulling long hours. We were shooting out in the canyons, uh, the Tanga Canyon and the hours were, I mean, it was fun, but you were getting up at two in the morning to be on set at three in the morning, you know, work a full 14 hour day and then, you know, do it again. I really liked the, what I liked about the film was that it's, you know, it's got this sort of horror genre to it, but it's also, you know, the second half is that sort of Rambo action movie kind of thing, you know? Uh, and right. you get a little bit of that hostile and saw, hills have eyes, uh, torture porn stuff that's happened in the middle, you know? And um, <laughs> I was actually pretty shocked when we screened it to see how, I mean, I turned my eyes away a couple of things, like how bloody, bloody and raw and, it kind of was. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a good thing, though, I guess, right? People are into that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was cool. It was, uh, yeah, I thought it was, like, I thought it delivered, basically. And I'm, I don't know what the budget was, but I know that it wasn't $20 million. And I know that there was, uh, I'm friends with Jared. Uh, oh, okay. I'm friends with Paul. And so I, I know, you know, and you know that I've shot, these type of movies as well. So I know what it right. takes. I know what, I know what the limitations are too. And so for, for knowing the limitations, I, I knew like, Oh, that's what they had to shoot here. This is what, you know, what they yeah. shot there and you know, how they shot it and why they shot it and stuff like that. Like, um, so at, overall, you know, the sort of, uh, filmmaking of it all, the, the sort of, uh, yeah, as a filmmaker, what am I, the words I'm looking for is basically like adapting, you know, sort of that running gun of figuring out how are you going to make the scene work with what you right. have in it. And, and, uh, we're in white space together. I know. And I can't wait to see it. <laughs> you've I, got, we, we, you've got a gruesome, Oh, I remember the worm scene that we, that you had. <laughs> oh yeah. And I think, you know, that that's, that's the funny thing is like, um, on, in that film, so we've had Ryan on the producer Ryan because him and I are right. We just did it. We just did a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, we're, we 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 um, funded a a film, an animated film that he's going to be working on that I'm going to be voicing a character on. And oh, we perfect. had him on to talk about that, but I keep in touch with Ryan, pretty close knit, where he fills me in on the progress of it. And uh, Ken, you know, you remember Kenny, the director? Yeah. And, uh, how he's really putting together the, the CG effects and why it's taking so many years to do is a, he's kind of a perfectionist cause that's, that's his world and he wants the thing to look really good. But what yeah, Ryan was right. telling me was 
that whole stuff with the worms and the stuff crawling through my skin. He's like, oh, you should see it now. Like, you know, it's like that thing where if Kenny does something, then like three weeks later, he wants to redo it. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have right. more of this. So I can't wait to see yeah. how the worms are crawling in my eyes and stuff like that. I like, know. You know. Inside the eyeballs and stuff. Oh, it should, God. It was... At the end of the day, it should, you know, I don't think we're going to recognize that film for what, you know, if I don't know if you've for seen how we earlier shot it earlier cut. Yeah, exactly. Well, definitely. I've seen it earlier. Shot, I've but... seen earlier uh, pieces of it, um, and I went over to the studio and I saw like how they're printing out the 3D images, also with an imaging machine, right. and it's it's really cool. And the video game, they're working on the video game. Yeah, it'll be like a um, an, an iPhone app game for it and stuff. Right. Like that. Yeah. So there's a it's it's definitely you know it's a lot of work. I understand why it's taking a long time, but I also want want the goddamn thing to get done you know what I, mean? I know but, uh, i know me too you know we have a lot of like uh our our, our show caters mostly to, oh like, and you know, in it, white space i got brutally i got stabbed coming out of the shower at white space on our ship that's right. <laughs> i think i did that i think i you I, did I, you I, killed me <laughs> i did that, that's i didn't right. want to get this the spoiler alert, but sorry, uh, uh, sorry. No, it's fine because Creech. Before you got on, I, I already, I already spilled the beans on that with Creech because he goes, "Oh, I okay. saw the trailer. I think you, you have a scene with her." And I go, "I would kill her. I killed her. I kill, I kill everyone." <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think Zulai uh, was the only one who uh, makes it out, and she gets that, shot out into space in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to him. I said, "I think she gets out in like a, a escape pod, but you know, even that." Does but she eventually, survive? she's gonna die. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. Which she she's just gonna die in a fridge. She gets a, she gets one more meal before she's dead, you know, because she's in the yeah. refrigerator, right? So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I can't wait to see that film. Actually, it's gonna be. It, I think that's gonna you be can't um, you can't wait for a white space. Yeah, I really can't because now it's been so long that it's you know like when you shoot a movie as you shoot a lot of them. Since you know so much of the movie, when you go and watch it, it you know, it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, oh, let me see how it comes together. But this will be one that we shot that we forgot about so much. And it's almost like watching ourselves in a movie that we didn't make. We're going to go like, oh, right. I, I forgot about that. Oh, that's cool. You know, so it's right, like yeah. you could really watch it from 10,000 feet away and go like, oh, I finally get to see something that I've. It wasn't like we just shot it six months ago, and I almost right. remember everything about it. So I, I know one thing, and this is you, we're also a Walking Dead podcast. We have a huge following of Walking Dead. That's actually how I, I met dead. my my um, my co-host Creech interviewed me for his original podcast, because I did a spoof called The Walking Deceased, and uh-huh. uh, and then we you know we do these updates on The Walking Dead with other fans and stuff as the season goes along and. Fear the Walking Dead. We need to do a little catch up. But I remember Costas was, uh, you know, he was in talks to do Negan. He was, mm-hmm. you know, uh, his agents were talking to the production there. And then all of a sudden he pops up on this screen. And I'm like, because I always said to him, I go, dude, you would kill that character. You know, you are mm-hmm. that guy. And um, I see a little bit of molding of, of, of this character in this movie of like, you know, this is, I can almost see that he, he probably brought that to it because he was already in that mode and in that zone. Um, it's funny, yeah. Well, it's funny, though. We shot The Horde in October of 2014. You know, right. so it was way before Negan came out. You know, I mean, I, you know and, um, and even writing The Horde, I didn't, you know, have that. But the funny thing is, if you look at even the way he was dressed and, like, with the bat right. and everything, it was, yeah, and, and that speech he was given, you know, to The Horde, yeah, it, was, it was funny. It was kind of uh, Negan-esque. <laughs> Yeah, and it's going to be hard for me to watch next season and not think of Kosas because I just feel like, hey, like he 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 definitely could have played nailed that character, and obviously at the on the Walking Dead, that is such going to be such a huge character for the next few Absolutely. years on there. So Absolutely. So going back to the Horde, you know, obviously yes. the the scenes where you're the teacher and things are going well and you're getting you know, hey, you're, you're getting the ring and you're going to get engaged, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sitting there going, oh, wow, how did Tiffany pull that off? But obviously when you get captured and then you're strapped to that bed and Costas is sort of like, you know, mentally torturing you at that point and saying like, hey, why don't you be my girlfriend? 
like, we're going to go to the beach. You know what I mean? Like, that was just the weirdest stuff. Like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, we're going to get out of here. What do you think? <laughs> it's like, I've mutilated a lot great. of people. But. He was great. I mean, he's, he's scary, but he is kind of like, because he's so confident, it's like charming, but scary. <laughs> like, what? Are you, you crazy? What is Short that, interrupt. Motherfucker? Oh, I like it. That's, that's flirting. We call this flirting. Uh, guys, I'm sorry I'm late, <laughs> but um, I was in a predicament. A friend of mine got uh, taken hospital. I'm free. I'm outside. If you hear dogs barking, I'll, I'll shoot them. Uh, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that on the radio. I am free and ready to talk. <laughs> Paul, Paul Logan was actually speaking. I'm here. That's a, I'm a what's up, brother? Everything's okay. I, I hate being late, but how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, my friend? Very good. I haven't seen you since Germany, by the way. You remember that good time we had there in Germany, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Is uh, this a public radio it, show? <laughs> you know what, though? It's, it's internet radio. I was just talking to Paul about this, how uh, you and I were talking about how they were, uh, The Walking Dead was, you were in discussions with uh, the Negan role on that, you know, uh, in right. terms of there was some interest. And next thing you know, I'm watching this film going like, fuck, this guy. He he definitely should have fucking been cast as Negan because you were just brilliant <laughs> in this movie and the viciousness of your character in this movie was at that level. You know what I mean? And, um, Thanks. You know. Well, I'm sure Jeff, Jeffrey Dean Morgan would have something to say about that, but when he's not looking, I'll get him anyway. The point is that I'd like, I didn't I didn't think about it uh, when we were doing it because you know it's sort of like when you're doing something, you your mind's on that and nothing else. But I see the similarities. There is a baseball bat, and, and there, there are speeches and things like that. But I'm glad it had that kind of ferocity because we were running and gunning with that, you know, lower budget, you know, mentality. And Paul Logan's jumping off roofs, and, and they're doing stunts that, that, that are worthy <laughs> on screen, I guess, of bigger movies. So, you Thanks, know, we did, we, we did our job as best we could with the time allowed. And I'm glad that uh, you saw some kind of similarity. Yeah, you know, we were, I was also saying that you did it first, bro. When we shot this, you know, a year and a half ago, and, you know, that, that, that Negan character just, just came out. So, you know, you, yeah. you put it on, on film first. <laughs> yeah, good way. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I still well, going to kill Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Go on. <laughs> Go yeah, on. I'd, like to see that, I'd like to see that grudge match, a little match of the two characters go at each other. That would be I, would, I would relish it. No, but I was going to tell you that we, they sent me the link to the Horde, and where, where I'm living right now, I have terrible Wi-Fi. My, well, just my, my Internet service is slow, and Time Warner actually just was found guilty for, like, slowing everyone. And I knew, I've been telling Creech this for months, going, my Internet service is so slow. Everything just locks oh, up horrible. every time I'm watching something. So I went to Starbucks to watch the movie, you know, oh, and right. it's on my laptop. <laughs> And I was just kind of like, there was moments where I was like, oh, sh-. you know, I had headphones on, so they couldn't hear it, but I could see people like kind of looking over my shoulder, like, what's he watching? And it's like, you know, it's like the guy's tongue is getting <laughs> cut out and you're strapped to the bed and right. like, blood and guts. And, and I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm really watching this for research. It's not like I'm, I'm just the guy that likes to come and watch these movies. At watch freaky things. Yeah. Right. Like with my latte. That's funny. In my old fashioned donuts <laughs> or whatever, you know? it's like, can I get my s'mores heated up, please? Or, uh... yeah, That's so that, funny. Oh my god, that, that was definitely. I tend not to try to watch anything completely rated R, you know. And, and that started. Yeah. And it's summertime, so it, it was during the day when all the kids. Were I was out going of to ask. That was my next question. Were you there at night during the day? You're just like sitting in the corner. No, yeah, it was daytime. School just got out because this was like last week, so school was out, and there's a lot of kids there. A lot of kids. Like, so <laughs> inappropriate to be watching, but Paul's gonna get on the phone in like a half hour. I gotta finish this film. So. Oh no! <laughs> Well, so I'm probably the only sure. one. Hopefully, that's hopefully those board. kids are renting. Hopefully, they are renting it, and watching it. Yeah, exactly. That's probably the best advertising. My um, my best friend's um, cousin is 20, and he's in London. And I got a call. He watched it, and he really enjoyed it. So, hopefully, a lot of people are they're checking it out. Costas, how did, how did how did you get involved in this film? Were you already buddies with Paul beforehand, and he brought you the script, or was this a uh, uh, you know, what was, where, how did this all occur? You know what? 
sometimes uh, there's a term called happy accidents. It happens on films. It happens in life. You know, you hear about big deals uh, when guys are playing golf and people will go, hey, oh, yeah, I didn't think of you. Yeah, let's do this. They make deals and shit like that happens. But with uh, this particular uh, occasion, uh, Paul and I happened to be just talking because we had met um, a chiller yeah. in, no, in, uh, in Jersey. And uh, yep. you know, one day we were having a phone call and it came up and he goes, you know, uh, maybe, and within a day or two, or no, actually it was a couple of days before, but he said, this thing's coming up, maybe it's a good idea. And I rocked up to the set and before you knew it, I was committed. And um, just, sometimes you just jump in with uh, good faith and it turned out to be pretty good because I've heard nothing but good things, you know, overall. I loved it. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, I, I, got, I work in the business, so I see the films. I understand the, the sort of nuts and bolts of what really ha- has to happen behind the scenes, and it's a lot. It's, you know, and I think, Paul, you'll attest to this, that until they call action on your first day of shooting, you're just like, is this really ha-? You know, any film can just fall apart at any minute. It's like, uh, oh, yeah. you know, it, th- that it's stuff never car. goes away. So, wait a second. Oh. So you're saying that... You know, Kostas, you, you came on, literally, th- this thing was uh, pretty much shooting almost, or what? No, well, it wasn't shooting yet, but it, it basically once we said yes, and a couple of days passed as they're prepping stuff, boom, it happens, you know? Dang. And that's what, what, what I mean by happy accidents. I'm, I'm saying that sometimes you, you're, you're, you envision a scene one way, you envision it one way, and things right. change because certain actors have a dynamic and directors trust them and blah, 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 and magic happens. And in this particular case, with a smaller movie when you're shooting 18 days, uh, when people seem to be on the same page and there's no diva bullshit and there's no, ah, you know, I don't want to do... It just happens and and people get lucky with the smaller type movies, even the bigger movies, you know. Shit just happens where things click. Um, And that's what I mean by happy accidents. Good people come together, they're helping each other instead of getting in each other's way, and that's what happens. We're, we're actually um, we're introduced to him prior to meeting Crenshaw. I think if I'm right, right? Because we had that cold yeah. opening scene with the, the guys, and he's like, welcome to our woods, or these are our woods. I forget your line. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then we're meeting Crenshaw. We, you know, I know, mainly because I know I was getting on an interview with you two guys, so I already knew, like, I know where this is going. I'm seeing these, these are dudes that are going to face off against they're sort of alpha males in the woods, you know, both having their paths kind of collide. Uh, but, you know, and Paul obviously is a physical specimen. He's a stunt coordinator. He's, he's got martial arts. But uh, in, in sort of Those coordinating. Cops. Yeah, well, there you go. Like, so, like, and you've got your boxing uh, background and stuff. So, like, what is the, um, you know, just in terms of the stunts and stuff like that, you know, was there how how sort of physical did that get? You know, in, in terms of like, did anything ever cross the line, or was it just uh, it's stunts or stunts? You know, uh, go. You can go first, Paul. Yeah. No. Um. Honestly. Um. You know. Here's the thing. You know. You never know who you're gonna work with, but me knowing Costas was a blessing because we've got that. You know, scene. You know, that. Uh, I'm trying to do this without spoilers, but the scene between us. And, you know, Costas is a pro. And that scene looks badass because Costas is a pro. And, you know, that's why I was so happy to have him on board for that reason as well, because this wasn't just, you know, a, a talking head roll for him. I mean, he's, he's hanging out of the side of you know, a car shooting, and there's, there's fights, and he's got that presence. And I knew he could bring it. And that's why, he, again, he raised the level of Atkinson up off that page because he could do all the physicality. And... Here's the thing. We, we went over it. We, co- you know, we, you know, I choreographed it. We coordinated it. And Jared called action, and it looks great because of, yeah. you know, what he could do. Yeah. You know, so but, that's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it, it's all preparation and, and his knowledge. But, you know, I was going to say, I, I got cut off for half the question, but you were talking about safety as well or how hairy it gets. Is that kind of right. the question? Right, exactly. That, yeah. Well, the, the bottom line is but when you're working with people that actually know how to fight, um, that are not, you know, advantageous uh, in their sickness. People are safer than ever because you can pull punches. I could punch him all day long in the body, even though he's got abs of steel. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> he does, by the way. Uh, you know, I could hit him all the time, and it could look like, because you know how to pull it, and that's not mm-hmm. showing off. It's just talking about when you know when you fight with people who know how to do their thing, they can make it look so good. They can keep missing you by that half an inch or six inches. They can yep. punch you in the stomach, and the, and you can go and sell it. When people don't know what they're doing is when shit happens and, and, and goes wrong. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, yeah. fortunately, everybody knew what they were doing. And, um, you know, you never really worry about it. And, but the, the small budget stuff and safety, and Paul was pretty much on top of it, like, because he knows his stuff and whoever was helping him knew this stuff. You know, like, you know, uh, shrapnel from the bullets, the fake bullets going to the right side, uh, you know, stuff with explosions. That's the stuff that I worry about much more. But when you got the right people there, they double, triple check stuff. But as far as physical... It was easy, and I, I got away with a lot because I didn't have to do like uh, too much running and jumping like Paul. But it's always good to be ready for that kind of stuff. But I went in there on short notice. But what we did was fun because you knew there's no ham bone in there. We're gonna do it, make it look raw, and uh, and get yeah. what we need with, without anybody going, oh, I fucked up my eye and things like that. What are you working on? So there is a um, kicking off a show, and it's called Ink and Blood, and it's about all the artists, like the Stan Lee characters, like all the people who created the comic world, basically, and uh, it's going to be a period piece, and um, we have a meeting with uh, Brian Burke, Bad Robot, um, in a week, and, um, and I've got Aaron Paul, who is interested in producing and being a part of it, but he also right now has a Hulu show as well, so um, yeah, so getting that going, and then I have a couple film projects that I'm producing on as well. And, uh, and of course, you produce the films, and then you act in, a, in the projects, and it's all, it's all gravy. <laughs> I do like the idea of the action star that's, you know, someone like a Seagal or Stallone, this is just me riffing here, but, like, getting on in the age and just sort of, like, eventually sort of forgetting those boundaries. <laughs> it's just right. and arms and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're sh- oh, oh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, so, so uh, Creech, uh, I actually have a co-host, Creech, and, and we tend to get questions from fans online and stuff like that. Creech, you have a, 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 are there some holes that I might have missed that you want to cover and stuff like that with Paul and Costas? But I do have a, a, a fan question for Costas. Uh, from Brian Daniels, and he he wanted to know, being that you you've you know been a, an actor for a while as well as as Paul, with your work on the the Saw film series, was there anything that you learned while working on that that you used in uh, the Horde? Uh, in in the Saw movies? Yeah. Yeah. Don't get in the trouble, and don't get in, don't put yourself in a position to be put in a trap. They're really hard to get out of. That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, look, I think that every experience uh, is a learning thing. Uh, when it comes to fighting, uh, there wasn't a lot of that fighting stuff, in the, although I did have some good fight scenes. I think just as you go along, you pick up a lot of uh, 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 tips and all kinds of stuff from different types of choreographers and whatnot. And when you get to do like over 20 movies, and you're sort of like, it's a different movie, it's a different fight scene with different people but in the end most of the same rules apply it's like watching a football game what are you going to do you got to make sure you catch the ball you've got to make sure you protect the quarterback you got to make sure this you got to make sure that sort of the same rules and principles apply you know what i mean so yeah you learn from every movie you do great job paul good job Costas, and uh thank you, thank you. With you guys later on thank you for the time paul, talk thank when you, you so much guys. Gotta, yeah you guys right, absolutely my brother all right, go back to killing people. Bye. <laughs> Thank Thanks so Maybe much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We had Paul, we had Costas, we had Amanda, and we had the director on. We really did a number on the horn, huh? We yeah, yeah, they took over our show for like a month. We had a horde on our show to talk about the horde. So we did. The irony of it all. And actually, it, it works great, too, because uh, they're actually getting ready, it's getting ready to come out on DVD now. And it'll be out on uh, Valentine's Day. We've had a lot of uh, crazy memories this, uh, the first half of, well, the first half, the entire year, I guess. It's been a lot of good and stuff. We should do, Prank phone yeah. calls. 
And I think tonight, I actually tried to set up a prank phone call for when you and I were going to do like two nights ago because some, I never pick up my phone anyway, even if it's my mom, um, especially if it's my mom. But, you know, I saw it was, I, most of them are just telemarketers. I know the numbers. I can see them when they come up. I go, I don't know anyone in Washington. I don't know anyone in Missouri. So I know the telemarketers. They don't leave messages. And um, so I decided to pick this one up, and it was something was like a, a robocall saying, this is your last chance. There's nothing wrong with your credit card, but, you know, if you stay on the line and hit one, we can help you refinance, you know, lower the interest rates or something. So I, I just did it just to see what would come on. And the guy said, oh, I see you're interested in refinancing your, you know, interest rates or whatever. And I, I was like, ah, yeah, they said it was my last chance for the new year and I wanted to get it in, but can you call me back in five hours? Because <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get him to call back during our show. <laughs> Screw with somebody, you know. And I think he just hung up, though. He knew. He knew I. And he was from India, and he still he still was uh, quick enough to know, like, oh, this guy's screwing with me. I think I might have came on a little too strong. It's like picking up a chick, you know what I mean? You you don't yeah, want to come on like, so strong. You gotta like, you know, suck him in a little bit on those prank phone calls. Exactly. I think next year we should we should start going back onto the uh, the internet thing so we can. We can get some, some crisp audio. Let's do that for 2017. 2017, back to the great audio. Yeah, our New Year's resolution is to clean up our audio, get back to recording in a studio type of setting. The problem is we're always doing it in odd hours, and we were recording in my bedroom. My wife's trying to sleep, and et cetera, et cetera. I thought I'd be moved into my house by now and have my own you know, office slash studio set up. It's been so many years now, I'm, I'm going to have to, like, buy all new computer equipment. That stuff's, like, sitting in a storage unit. It's like I'm going to break it out, and, and people are going to be like, how do, you, how do you get this old Apple? Where'd this come from? That's worth money now. You can make the furniture out of it. We should, we, should, we should touch base on all the stars that we lost this year. We lost quite a few, and at the end, it started that people started falling a little faster. I was getting a little worried, you know what I mean, whether I was even going to make it. Yeah, yeah, I was. I literally was was like, I need to get in my car, go to Dave's house with some bubble wrap, and just, you know, carry some adrenaline shots too, you know, no, whatever. No, I was very careful around the nail gun this last week because I had the nail gun or when I was standing under ladders or whatever I was doing, I was like, this would be, I, you know, I don't want to be the last guy going in 2016 with all the big names that went, I'm not going to get a mention anywhere. I'm not going to get one little. They might just throw up half a headshot at the end of one of these award shows since I'm not really an awards caliber person. You know, oh, you know they would just put up a picture of you as Doofy. Yeah, in the, in the final little thing where it's like... They just see you saluting. Night. Yeah, and there'll be like a few other actors from 1934 you don't remember, and, and, then it's, and then it's down to like associate producers or directors or writers or something that you never saw their faces anyway, and they just put a name up, and I'd be somewhere in there. They wouldn't roll like a clip of mine. But that's the only thing that goes to my head is like I'm never going to do any work that's going to warrant even being nominated for an award or being at an award show, let alone winning, to actually have to have an acceptance speech. You know, because there are a lot of actors, I would think if you're an actor or a writer, you know, you want to win awards. You want that moment. You're in it to win the Academy Award. You, you dream of that day of getting up on that stage and being able to say your acceptance speech. And I know I've thought about my acceptance speech, and I'm not the only one because when I've told other actors, I have to go, yeah, yeah, I drive around all the time, you know, always piecing something together. Because you, you want to have it somewhat rehearsed in a sense of, in your brain that you're thinking of like, what would I do if I get up that moment? Am I going to like moon everybody? Am I going to tell all the people that screwed me over, like screw you? Or are you going to take the higher road and thank God and thank your mom and all the people that have helped you? And if you do that, you don't want to forget people. So you got to make sure you got to get it all in before the music plays. There's a lot that goes on. You, you know, you can't just wait till you're nominated to start throwing that together. This is, that's basically your chance to speak at your own funeral, you know? Um, you're giving your own eulogy at a, at a, in a weird way because you have a moment. To, you're at the pinnacle of your career, and if you've worked really hard for it, and some people get it early on, these awards, they get it 
where they haven't put too much work in and they don't know what to say. And then there's people that are like, they're going to get it like the award as a kind of more of a cumulation, if that's even the right word, cumulation, cumulation, combination, not combination, but you know, it's like the cum of all of your work and they finally just give it to you. Like Martin Scorsese, he got it for one of his movies, but really they were giving it to him for, all of his movies, you know, or, you know, whatever movies he's done. And there was somebody I saw recently that won an Academy Award. It was like, well, it wasn't his best work. Um, actually, somebody, I think I saw it on Facebook. It might have been on Twitter, though. They, they, there was a very interesting thing going around about how um, they think all the celebrity deaths this past year were, could be traced back to Leonardo DiCaprio finally winning an Oscar. Apparently him winning that opened the seven gates of hell, and, and that's what's caused everybody, all these famous people to die. Yeah. You know what? That might be who I'm thinking of. That I thought it was probably Leonardo for that uh, Reverend. For the Reverend. Remember for the Reverend last year? Oh, Reverend, yeah. It AKA wasn't raped by a bear. But he didn't win for Titanic. He didn't win for, you know, some of the other movies he's done. Wolf of Wall Street. Um, he's, he was great in that. Um, you know, there's Blood Diamonds, I think, or something like that. He did. You know, um, there was the one with you know, the Scorsese movie he did, The uh, Departed. You know, oh yeah, that movies, was a fantastic you know? movie. Right. So there's other things that he didn't win for, but when he did this one, it's like, okay, now's your time because you, we're also giving that to you because you didn't get it for Titanic, and you probably should have. You know, and you didn't get it for this. But you were too young in Titanic. So we didn't give it to you. And you, you. This one was, this movie didn't qualify. It just wasn't, overall it wasn't good enough, but you were great in it. You know what I mean? So now we finally did a movie that was like, all right, it, it feels like an Academy Awards title type of movie. It was very good, and you were great in it. So we're giving it to you. So, yeah, so we definitely had some people pass. I was worried myself. That's what I'm saying. I, I would, normally I'm going like, all right, my I got to do something to get nominated this year. This year, I was like, I got to do. I got to make sure I don't die, because I just don't want. I don't think I've done enough yet to even be on the little like, you know, hey, remember, and especially like if you die the last week, that you almost like get lumped into like, well, we'll let's push into 2017. You know, there's people that die in January or February, and then when they come up on the screen, you're like, oh, he's dead. Oh, my God. Oh, that's right. I forgot he did die. You know, like the people that obviously like the newest people like George Michael and Carrie Fisher and her mom, Debbie Reynolds, and, you know, David Bowie's going to be a big one. I mean, that was probably the, one of the biggest names. I don't even think Lemmy will even qualify, but let's not forget Lemmy passed away. Or you got Alan Prince. I don't think Prince. I don't think China's going to show up, though. Oh. Prince, that's right. Yeah, China, you might forget about China. Uli, we've got some breaking news, Dave. Oh, no. Somebody else what? died. No. Father Mulcahy from uh, MASH died. William Christopher. He just, this is exactly what I was talking about. It's, it's, it's not playing around. It's, it's taking no, no, no prisoners, hours. and it's, it's like four hours left. Yeah, he just squeaked in to, to the whole, like, uh, he, he's on the credits now of the Oscars, you know, or the the Golden Globes for sure, Nash, you know. Oh, that's any, yeah, any, any more. It's like the entire Oscars is going to be the in memoriam. They're going to have to right. do the winners and the credits of the, of the show. Exactly. Yeah, it's going to be a long one, and uh, that's why I'm just hoping to stay alive. I've got four more hours. And I have four more hours to accomplish, because for me it's 8.42, so really I have three hours. Three hours and 20, three hours and 18 minutes. I still have three and a half hours and 18 minutes to accomplish my New Year's resolution from 2016, January 1st, which was, you know, I got to lose 15 pounds and I got to stop watching internet porn. And I think I can do it, Creech. That's uh, I think you can seven do pounds. That. I can chat for about 20 more minutes, and then if I just, like, get in a hot sauna for the next two hours and pull off seven pounds of water weight for each hour, I think I can do it. I think I can get in there. 
and, and, exactly. and make sure I shut and just shut the Wi-Fi off while I'm in the hot sauna. I'm go. I'm gold. I'm, I can say mission accomplished for 2016, and then we'll start over. 2017, I'm only going to commit to trying to record this podcast on the computer system that we had set up before, so we get better audio. Exactly, and, and my my uh, my goal this year was just to survive, and uh, I did. And uh, now I've I've actually well, this is episode 45. But overall, in podcasting, I'm like at 92 or 93 episodes I've done. So by the time we return, I'll be nearing 100. Or actually, by the time we hit 52, which would be technically a full year for us in episodes, I'll, I'll, I'll the 52nd episode, I'll, I'll reach 100 episodes total podcasting. That's I kind would of exciting. say the one thing that I just put together now, and I don't know, maybe I should really look at the list, but we're just talking the bigger names. Um, and I'm including Lemmy because I have worked with Lemmy. I was I wouldn't say I was friends with Lemmy, but we hung out several times. So I knew Lemmy. I also worked with China, as you know, so I knew China. And um, and I was friends with Carrie Fisher on a basis of I worked on scripts up at her house, and then we hung out once. So I knew Carrie Fisher. I probably could have been closer friends with Carrie had I, like, been somebody that engages and, like, oh, let me send her emails or let me Twitter, but I don't – I'm not like that. You know what I mean? I had too much stuff going on. Had I known she was going to be doing another Star Wars, maybe I would have kept in touch much more just so I could, like, get into a – Get a cameo? Of, um, yeah, get a cameo as, like, a Wookiee or something like that. Ooh, a little her, touchy – little touchy her, dealy. A little touchy. I was a little bit of a boy toy. Let's just put it that way. So, but the bottom line was, and I met her mom up at her house. So I met her mom. I don't know if her mom was all there, but I met her mom. So, but this is the thing is, so there was four people on that list, minimum four that I actually personally had some um, interactions with. That's got to be uh, that. That is that scary to me? Maybe it's showing like, oh wow, I'm getting older because now there's going to be start. There's people that I know, you know, that are dying on these moratorium lists. So it's now getting to the point where, too, even I. I mean, yeah, I, I know that I'm quote unquote younger. I mean, but now, now even stuff from my childhood is starting to die. So I'm like, oh gosh. So this if year was I, like bad for that. Yeah. If I continue to do some. Uh, you know, one or two films a year, even if they're just small roles, till I'm 75, that'll be like 20, almost, you know, 27 years, 27 years more. I should qualify to, to, make the li- to make some sort of list if I can put in that type of continued work. Would you think? I agree. I think, I think you'd get it anyway, though, because, you, you know, you've been in some, some good stuff. I mean, yeah, it has nothing that's been nominated for Academy Awards, but it's it's not like you haven't had memorable roles. I mean, so for you yeah. personally, who was the biggest in the celebrity on the celebrity side? Which one do you feel like I wouldn't say affected you, but what do you think the biggest loss for you was on your side? Huh. The biggest, the biggest loss. I don't know. I might, I might actually say one of the recent ones. Uh, I, I think George Michaels is kind of. Kind of, kind of big for me. Okay, you need to extrapolate on that one because I, <laughs> I don't think I've seen George Michael do a goddamn thing in years, so I don't know. He hasn't, how and it was, it was purely on the amazingness of him as a singer back in the day. I mean, I okay. grew up on his, I grew up on his music. Um, my mom was obsessed with him and thought he was the sexiest thing on earth. So uh, she would always play his music. So I, I, you know, I heard it over and over again, and, and it was it was good music. And uh, yeah, then he got caught in controversy. Yeah, I hear they still have a plaque. They have a plaque at that like um, Beverly Hills bathroom where he was like jerking off out the window. You know, people outside. He was standing on a toilet, and there's a little window, and he was caught jerking off to you know kids or. People playing out in the park they have a little plaque so there. And the reason, I, and the reason I, I went with George, I mean, 
I would say China because, I mean, I grew up a fan of wrestling, and she was a, a big wrestler in the, you know, in the WWF when I watched it. But, I mean, me and you saw her two weeks before she, she was dead, and she was looking horrible then. So, I mean, hers wasn't that much of a shock. Right. Yeah, no, George Michael was definitely a shock. I read an article with his lover. He, you know, we die, he died that night, like, the, you know, went to bed. He he was with his lover, and, you know, he was going to bed, and the lover's like, well, I'm, I'm not going to stay tonight. And he's like, okay, just wake me up before you go-go. And then his lover said, next thing you know, wham, he was dead. That was that was, uh, it was very funny. Thank you. That's what I do. But and now he has freedom. With you, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna downplay China or the con- contributions of Wham frontman George Michael. I just think like neither of them were, uh, like, they don't affect me because it wasn't. There was nothing. I go, wow, in 2017 or 2018 or 2019, I'm not gonna see this or I'm not gonna get this from that person. Like they're. They're gone, and therefore it, it has affected my life because now my life will be different in the next four years. So I would say it's probably Prince, David Bowie, or um, Carrie Fisher. I mean, I Carrie Fisher would be a Carrie big Fisher, one. Yeah, it's probably like the Star biggest. Wars. Yeah. She, she yeah, just somebody. because, like you said, she, she's got – I mean, she was in the middle of, you know, doing the, the, the next three Star Wars – at least she finished yeah. the one that's coming out next year. That one was completed by her. So um, now they just have to figure out, before they start shooting the final one uh, in March, how they're going to, to fix her character. Apparently they're doing reshoots on Episode 8, though, um, early next year, too. So I'm, well, I'm obviously they're going to find something there. So, yeah, let me clarify something. So have you, you have definitely have official knowledge that they have to do reshoots, that they're doing reshoots to do something for the story to, for her in, in the one they haven't shot. What I get, this is what I'm getting at. Harrison Ford died, you know, Han Solo dead in the first one, right? Yeah. I thought that this one was pretty much probably going to be her last one anyway, that they probably kill her in this one anyway. But did you hear otherwise that she didn't die in this one, and that I haven't heard that, that but, she she didn't die. I've heard she has a, a major role in this movie, which could very well also lead to her death. But um, they had already planned to do reshoots um, in the beginning of the year for some last minute fixes for the movie. Right, uh, right. So, so if they didn't, and if she didn't die, they definitely are probably going to examine a way to write her out. I mean, they could they could actually not write her out at all uh, if they get her state's permission like they did with Peter Cushing uh, in uh, Rogue One, where they just literally mm-hmm. computer-generated an entire person for the entire movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and look, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Let's just stick on Carrie Fisher and the, the, the Star Wars films right now. <laughs> in the last one <laughs> that we watched... What was it called? Not oh, movie, the, for, the Force Awakens. The Force Awakens. Okay. First of all, Harrison Ford looked great, but and I'm, I know Carrie Fisher. I've met her a few times. Um, you know, and she's had work done, and like anyone, and she was a maintenance work type of lady, meaning, and she smoked a lot. Carrie Fisher was a chain smoker. When I knew her, though, and this was maybe four years ago, 2013, um, she was chain-smoking those vapor things. You know those vaporizer things or vape things? The the heat things? Yeah, and it was a big one that looked like she had a lightsaber in her mouth because this this was one of those big e-cig things um, where you'd puff out a big, giant, thing of smoke you know what I mean in fact in that vape world there is like oh how big can you get the puffs to be you know what I mean how much smoke can you blow off you ever seen that like I I would think I sometimes like because at those conventions where people go outside out front of the hotel to smoke some people are smoking cigarettes some people have those big vapor things and if there's two or three of those guys around it looks like there's a a car on fire 
you know, out by the valet guy. And I'm like, what the hell's going on over there? And it's like, oh, no, those three guys are just vaping, you know, and it's just like they've got the big blowing clouds or whatever they call it, you know what I mean, puffing clouds or something, vaping clouds, I don't know. They have a term for it. She was into that, and, and here's the thing. She clearly had a heart situation. The, that, that smoke is worse for you probably. That vape stuff has got to be worse for you. The chemicals that are in there, there's like nickel iodine or something like that. They don't know. You, there's no long-term tests on that stuff. For all we know, that's worse than regular tobacco. Would you agree? I would. I would never. I've never wanted to try one of those. Cause, I mean, I, I can just imagine. I mean, anything that's supposed to be an healthy alternative of something that, you know, usually causes some form of cancer probably isn't that much better. Okay. So, and I'm I'm getting to a point here on Carrie Fisher, and if people want to go and look at the Force Awakens, but I think we've all seen it. And um, the thing is, this is so she. You know, Carrie was like, okay, got a little nip tuck got a little filler under my eyes, got the wrinkles filled or whatever it is here, but also the Botox is a big thing. She smoked a lot, and smokers, especially women, especially once you get up in that 60, if you're doing that much smoke, whether you're vaping or not, your skin gets damaged, right? And so then you have to do a little bit more work. And um, so I don't know if it's from her having those smoker lips you know the you know the smoker lips I'm talking about, like the kind of wrinkly lips. Yeah. Especially, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Um, I know exactly. So either she had work done before the first film, The Force Awakens, for the smoker lips, but also someone said, "Oh no, she did suffer a stroke. That she had a stroke, or a mini stroke, you know, three years ago." Did you have you heard? Did you hear anything that she? Or was that common knowledge that she she did have a stroke or another mini heart attack years back? I can't recall. That me that, neither. Um, that's why I, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. And that's why I when somebody told me that I go, oh, I don't really remember that, but it's possible. You know, it's like people are private; they don't want to talk about like George. You know the right. Guy. I mean, right now people are the internet's arguing over whether or not uh, Sinbad starred in a movie or not. Whether like, Sinbad starred in a movie? Yeah, there's there's a whole group of people saying that there was a movie called Shazam that had Sinbad as a genie, uh, and Sinbad says that movie was that doesn't exist, and there's no rec- there's you can't find it online, you can't find nothing from it, but uh, yeah. there's it's it's a whole thing yeah. going online right now where people are like it was a movie, and then Sinbad's like no, it wasn't a movie. There was a movie. It wasn't Shazam though. You're, they're thinking of Shaxam. Shaxam was Shaquille O'Neal as Shaq was Kazam, yeah. No, and that was, he was in Steel. Was, now, Sinbad was in a movie where he played a genie, but it, I don't think it was called Shazam. I think it was like it had something genie in it or something like that, or just I think it was just called Aladdin or something like that, or. Uh, um, oh, boy, Aladdin. There definitely is, uh, or here's the situation. Someone did a poster years back as a joke. You know what I mean? Um, but I thought you were saying that Sinbad, that there's an argument going whether he started a movie this year. That would be hilarious. Like, no, I didn't. I haven't worked this year. No, you started this movie. I did not. Or is Sinbad dead? I Wasn't there like uh, a... <laughs> You're changing. I don't know what you're doing because you're looking like a feed. You're changing. We're on the Carrie Fisher thing, and we're about to go to the Wham guy again. Now we're on the Sinbad. I, he looked like he had, you know, some terminal illness. The last couple times I've seen him, he looked like really skinny and really kind of not healthy. I don't know. So it wouldn't have shocked me if he was dead. He might have been someone you said, oh, no, he died earlier this year. Or he's, is he alive or dead? That, I bet you you get... 40% of the people not knowing if Sinbad is alive or dead. Oh, going back to the, the dead people, I think it was probably Carrie Fisher died. Me is probably the hardest one because I, you know, we're going to see her in a movie, and you, you're not going to be able to stop thinking about, oh, she's dead when you watch that movie. Oh, and, but and you, of course, they're going. 
it's a godsend to Disney because it's not like Star Wars isn't a billion dollar franchise as it is, but this yeah. may push it into highest grossing film ever now yeah. because most movies get a boost if if an actor dies from it, like The Dark Knight and all that. Yeah. And now with her and Star Wars being as big as it is anyway, and like Force Awakens made almost a billion by itself, so it could very well break uh, Avatar's record uh, now oh. thanks to her death. So, I mean, Disney, while, of course, you know, they have to, as a company, be like, we're, we're, we're saddened by our passing. But, there, you know, there's some people in Disney being like, this is really good for our movie. We're going to make a crap right. load of money now. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. But, uh, and I felt like David Bowie passing, because he was still prolific. I mean, he had an album out just when he died. And he was, and Prince, too. I think Prince and David Bowie were still going to uh, be delivering music and both of them were still um evolving as artists you know what i'm saying and and uh, i wouldn't say pushing the limits but they weren't done being creative they weren't done uh changing who they were they were both chameleons in sort of senses obviously bowie a bit more but prince was just as much of an enigma and a chameleon with his music in terms of um what's his style what's his sound what's he going to put out so i think both of them we lost, you know, potential great albums and, and music that would have been cool. Because I loved David Bowie's voice, and um, and and I, I loved Prince's just uh, his creativity, his his song, you know, his songwriting was awesome. So I will so also add. Thing. Go ahead. I will well, also add to mine because I, I was thinking about it while you were talking. That uh, Alan Rickman is one that that. Oh, Definitely sad to me this yeah, year. That, that, yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to die. die. He heard Harry when Potter he died. That's another one that like, okay, he might die too early in the year, and you don't remember. And then when the Oscars come up and they play his thing, it's like, oh shit, that's right, he's dead. When did when did he die? In June or something? I think it was like March or April. Yeah, see, that's an early death. You know what I mean? In, in terms of the year to get to that sort of, like, award season and credit thing where they play some people are going to be like, oh, that's right, oh, he's gone. Yeah, he was great. Great performances. Some very memorable roles. Oh, and, yeah. And memorable roles in the, in the way that he actually made the movie. Our, first, he made the movie better, but he was probably the best part of those movies. And Die Hard and Galaxy Quest are two that come to mind that he was you know, the linchpin of like, wow, he was, he was, he was a, a bulldozer in those movies. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls uh, from, but you know, Nakatomi Plaza. Right. That's true. Exactly. Yippee, yippee ki Let me ask you a question. Are we going to, are, are we, do we have any interviews this uh, episode? I mean, your daughter did some interviews at um, the Walker Stalker. Or have we played those already? Have you just released those as like one-offs, or are we adding any of that into this episode or future episodes? What's going on with that? Yes, what well, well, will go on. Um, one of them I released video-wise on Christmas Day, um, but we'll still release it on the on the podcast uh, starting in January. Uh, she, you know, she, I was like, you know what? Most of the people here I've interviewed, um, so I was like, I'm just gonna let her do some interviews, so she had to go around and she interviewed a lot of people. Some of them we have to wait till February due to AMC, because well, as most press can't interview Walking Dead people when it's not in season, we have press approval from AMC. It's just we then have to go by their guidelines on when we can release it, um, so we can't release it until the show's getting ready to come back on, but she got interviews with uh, some of the, the dead cast members like Michael Chenor and uh, Kyla Kennedy, and she interviewed uh, Xander Berkeley and uh, Carrie Payton, who played, you know, plays King Ezekiel, and Alana Masterson, who plays Tara. And uh, she got, I think, one or two more. She got, well, she got to she got to ask Michael Rooker a question as well. So she got she got some good stuff that we'll be releasing on the podcast. Um, I'm actually really? um, pretty pretty annoyed that. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even think to go uh, get an interview with John Carroll Lynch, 
seeing as you two had history. Oh, that's right. And, Bubble Boy. Yeah. And uh, that's like, my daughter's even more mad because she's been obsessed with that movie since she was little. Um, Actually, and, there's a little more history on the John Carroll Lynch one. is, um, As you know, with the Doug character from Ghost World, I think, of, you know, I told you that there was a point where we were making a movie with that character. And um, people were cast. The movie was cast. Sets were being built. And, uh, and a lot of screen tests were done, too. And so, like, the my nemesis in that movie when screen tests were done and he was cast was uh, um, Ashton Kutcher. So I have, you know, we never shot the movie, but I've got the screen test of myself and Ashton Kutcher doing two scenes from the movie. And John Taylor Lynch was playing uh, Ashton Kutcher's dad. And he auditioned. I can't remember if he screen test or he... I don't remember if we did screen tests or I just have the audition tapes because in the room you roll camera, so I have all the auditions on tape as well of all these actors that came in. I think the guy that got the role to play the dad was Bob, and I forget his last name. He was the warden in the Shawshank Redemption. I forget his last name, Bob somebody. He might be dead now too. He might have died too. Um, yeah. The John Interesting. Those, those, those would probably be some uh, some some pretty awesome tapes. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure. They're all on VHS, like I told you. So I got uh, someday I got to dig those out and then go find a VHS player and then figure out how to digitally put the stuff on and uh, archive it. And then so when um, when I reboot that and just try to rejigger the whole because there's I think there's three different versions of the script. There was a version that was going into production. Then after that didn't go, I rewrote another version. Then I got together with some big-name um, comedy director, writers. I'm not going to say who they were, but um, we took my old uh, second script and we rewrote another half of it with Matthew McConaughey developing it. He was the producer on it. And, uh, and that didn't go either because that one involved – the original one was Demolition Derby, kind of like a Demolition Derby plot. Then it moved on to uh, magic, and it was like a Houdini escapism, that kind of David, like a David Blaine type of crap. And then the third one got a little bigger, where it was even bigger and more magic elements. And what killed it was it was being shopped around town, and people were interested. And then um, Steve Carell and uh, Buscemi and... Um, Jim Carrey, they did a, a magic movie. Remember that one? It was like some sort of broad comedy magic movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. That movie didn't do too well. No, it was like Vegas Magicians. My thing, we always, it was more like strip mall, you know, party clown magician stuff. It was, you know, the guy hung out at, I think it was like Magicropolis, was like the magic store, you know what I mean, at a strip mall. And he got, he had a job. The Doug character had a job dressed as a clown, you know, and would go and do birthday parties and just do crappy magic stuff. But there was a magic competition at the mall, you know, sponsored by Magicropolis. And uh, he was trying to win that, you know. He was trying to win. I think, no, it was at the Armada Inn or something like that. Like, <laughs> the finals were at Armada Inn. I think the, the semifinals or the qualifying was at the mall, you know, next to the fountain in the food court. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I do want everyone to have a great 2017, including myself, including you and my family. I wish everyone help, and I know there's people out there struggling on many levels, whether it's with, you know, uh, anxiety or depression of their current states uh, or health issues or financial issues that are real. You know, all of it is real, and, um, you know, my thoughts are always with everyone out there. Um, so if you guys have a great 2017, I'm going to have a great 2017. So let's work together and do that, including you, Creech. I will do my best. Hey, uh, I'll talk to you next year. Cause that's always all right. I'll talk that's to you that. next year.
Shut up and sit down. Thank you for listening to the Dave and Creed Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Dave and CJ. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Creed Creative Productions or any of its affiliates.